this morning I gave you a task, quite a simple task, to just be present, mind and body together. Well, simple in words, but maybe not so simple to realize. I'm quite sure that every single one of you, the mind wandered away many times. The mind wanders off, past and future, other places, other times, a sort of time-traveling magic carpet. You find yourself imagining yourself in another place. You're in an argument with someone that you had last week. You're in some future destination. The mind does this all the time. But it raises a very interesting question. You give yourself a task like that, to have a mind that doesn't wander, to have a mind that is present, a mind that stays where the body is, and you fail. So who's in charge of your mind? Who decides what you think about and when you think about it? You might imagine that you're in charge of your own mind, but the evidence is against that. So who decides what you think about and when you think about it? Or turn it the way around, when you decide to uh, focus on something and concentrate on something, who decides you're not going to? You're going to be distracted. Because that's our experience, isn't it? The mind is all over the place. We try and think about something and we can't, and we try and not think about something, and we can't do that either. Hmm. What this points to is something that we easily overlook and we habitually overlook. We don't actually understand what's going on. We, are, we don't understand how we tick. We don't really understand ourselves at all. But that could be a rather an uncomfortable thought. So we just live by the assumption that we, we do know and it's okay and we'll try and get things right. But it's just a simple exercise, and it takes five or ten minutes, reveals the lie in this. We actually don't know. This is points towards this word ignorance that we use in Buddhism. It's a sort of a technical word, but it's pointing in this direction. A fundamental lack of understanding, a lack of knowing covered over by a story that we do know. Yeah, well, I know I get a bit distracted at times, but I, 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 I'm, I, I, I'm responsible for my actions and I'm in charge. And uh, I can learn to do better and it's okay. But just five or ten minutes sitting still, it's not actually so okay. It's just a story we tell ourselves to comfort ourselves. The reality that is exposed to us is very different. We actually don't know what's going on. Our reaction to this can be quite different depending on the sort of personality we have, perhaps. We can become quite intrigued by this, quite curious. This might be an intellectual curiosity, trying to understand it, trying to work it out, but it might be rather more personally touching. A sense of, ooh, hmm, I just don't know. I ought to know, I think so. Um, how can I find out? I need to know. It's not right not knowing. It may also express itself in other ways. Sometimes you can feel afraid. You feel the sort of ground's being pulled from under you. You feel insecure. You feel lost. So it can express itself in different ways. Now in everyday life, we often have strategies. For example, if we feel a bit, a bit sort of disconcerted or a bit confused, we sort of uh, might put the TV on and get a packet of cookies and everything will be all right in 10 or 15 minutes. But here you're sitting on the cushion. 
and the period of sitting has another 20 minutes to go and there's no TV and no cookies. Oh, what can I do? Hmm. I'm not even supposed to shuffle a bit, sort of, you know, and comfort myself by shuffling and changing position. What do I do? I'm sitting, sitting here, staring in the face. All this stuff going on in my head. And I'm not in charge of it. Hmm. So we can quite naturally sometimes tip into what we refer to as the investigative mode of practice. Now we need, maybe we need to have some uh, tips on how to do that, but the motivation to investigate can arise simply out of sitting. The realization that there's something to be discovered. At least we hope it's to be discovered. What if it's undiscoverable? That would be even worse, wouldn't it? Hmm. So there are these two aspects of practice, which this is how the traditional sort of breakdown of practice into two parts. Calming the mind. Cultivating a mind which is present. Training the mind so it doesn't wander off quite so much. Calming the mind, samatha, the Sanskrit word. And that's paired with vipassana, investigation, inquiry. Having a sense of there's something to be discovered, not to be hidden from, not to be smothered over, to feel comforted, but being willing to look very deeply into the mind. So we can see how calming the mind, training the mind to be calmer, can lead automatically into investigation. And investigating the mind and breaking through can lead to a mind which is more at ease, calmer. They go together, actually. We describe them as two for the purpose of convenience and explanation, but they, they go hand in hand. If you have a mind which you call calm, but it's not actually investigating, it's probably more a dull mind. The mind has switched off, and so it seems relatively calm, but actually it's just not paying attention to anything. It's switched off. And if you have a mind which is investigating in too wordy a way, too thinking a way, too analytical a way, it's not calm. That's not quite what we mean by investigation. It's more a deep looking, a listening, a feeling, a sensing. And with that, that sort of investigation comes a deep calm. Very often when people learn about meditation, the first thing they learn is about calming the mind. That's, that's appropriate because most of our, our minds are very busy and scattered. So we learn methods of calming the mind. Maybe we make a little progress with calming the mind and we get a sense of it being quite a long way to go. And so we emphasize working on calming the mind and that becomes our main practice. This can be very useful because uh, it is indeed useful to be able to train the mind to be more centered and present. But sometimes people overlook the need to bring in this second aspect of practice, to investigate the mind. On this retreat, you could almost say we come at it the other way around. We are starting with arriving and settling the mind this morning, but we'll pick up a method of investigation this afternoon, and we sort of bring them along together after that. In a sense, we emphasize the investigation, but the calming comes along with it. You'll see how that works when we're doing it. Now each of you are probably using quite different methods of meditation at the moment. That's okay. A method that you're familiar with is, is okay just to do it. Help settle you in. But uh, if you're using a method of, if you're well settled in a method of calming the mind, you can begin to make the first steps towards investigation just by broadening the attention slightly. So let me explain a little what I mean by that. For example, many of you are probably focusing on the breath awareness, counting the breath or following the breath, maybe a recitation. 
Buddha's name, or Ahato, something like that. Or maybe uh, body awareness, sound illumination. So typically we have a focus of awareness, the body, the recitation, the breath. And we train ourselves to remain focused on that. And when the mind wanders away, we've got somewhere to bring it back to. We bring it back, shall we say, to the awareness of the breath. And so when the mind is not on the breath, we know it's wandered and we bring it back. We find the mind somewhere else, we bring it back. And gradually, over quite some time, we find we can stay with the breath for longer periods of time before the mind wanders again. We can have a more continuous sense of breath awareness. And we can gradually expand that till it becomes quite stable. Now you may be early on or further on along that path of being more stable on your focus of awareness. But you don't have to wait until you reach the end of that path. What you can do is slightly broaden the attention. I'll use the example of the breath, but it could be one of the other things. You're aware of the breath. You somewhat have some stability on the breath for some of the time. You've probably been training yourself to ignore everything else so that you don't get distracted from the breath. Part of your way of, part of your way of focusing on the breath has been in some way by dulling the mind. You've dulled the senses so that the sound doesn't distract you from the breath. You've dulled the senses so you're not disturbed by people walking past you, something in your field of vision. This is a technique to help you focus, but it is a sort of dulling of the mind. Now, a little experiment to test is can you allow the, allow the senses to open up and still remain focused? So you're focused on the breath. You're quite clearly aware of the sensations of the breath or the recitation or the body awareness, whatever it might be. You're quite aware of this sensation, but you just allow yourself to be aware. Well, in fact, there are sounds. Roof timbers creak sometimes. A car drives past, somebody coughs. For some reason there's somebody walking in the room while we're sitting. You hear these sounds. Now if you've really been training the mind to be calmer, it has the capacity to hear these sounds without attaching to them. So you don't have to switch the senses off to, to maintain focus on the breath. You can allow the senses to be open. You just allow yourself to hear the car in the distance, just there. It doesn't deflect your attention. You still remain centered and present. It's just that it happens to be a car. It happens to be a beam of sunlight. You in, remain in contact with the breath, but the attention is wider than just the breath. We have a mnemonic to help here. Let through. Let be, let go. So let through means don't dull the senses, don't dull the awareness. Just because your task is focusing on the breath, you can still allow a thought to arise in the mind. You can still allow a sound to be heard. No problem, let it through. Actually, putting effort into suppressing it sort of makes the mind quite tired. So just let things be as they are. Let them through, let them be. There's no problem at all that a memory arises in the mind, or a thought, or an itch in the arm. Let it through into awareness, no problem. The problem comes when we start fussing about it. So how about if you just have the awareness of the breath, then you have the awareness of an itch, and you know that an itch sensation arises, hangs around for a while, and it goes in its own time. A sound of a bird singing, or a car going past, or someone coughing. It arises. It's there for a certain length of time, and it's gone. We don't have to do anything with it. It looks after itself. A memory arises in the mind. We don't have to attach to it and travel with it. We can just be aware that, yes, that particular memory has arisen. 
but I'm, my task at the moment is not to engage with it. I'll allow it to be there in the mind, because it's already there, actually, and it'll go. So it's opening the attention wider, which in itself is a form of investigation, because it's a form of letting you know what the mind gets up to, rather than the mind being some adversary that you have to battle with and calm it down. It's more like something you just watch it doing its own thing. There are some metaphors here for calming the mind. Trying to calm the mind by force is a bit like uh, if you've got a lake full of ripples and you want the lake to be mirror-like, reflecting the trees. So you go to the side of the lake and every time a ripple comes towards you, you flatten it. And the next one comes and you flatten it. It'll be quite a long time before you have a mirror-like lake if you take that approach. But if you just sit and wait, if the conditions are right, if it's not a windy day, the mirror will, the lake will by itself become mirror-like. Another metaphor is you have a jar of muddy water. It's all shaken up with muddy water. You just put it down and you let it settle. You can't speed it up. You just let it settle. If you sort of look at it half settled and try and shake the bits to go down a bit faster, it doesn't work. Just leave it alone and in its own time it settles. But you can still be, keep an eye on it, you can notice it. It's rather like that with the mind. You can just sit there, the mind can gradually settle. We can make it more disturbed by thinking about stuff, by fussing about stuff. But we can just simply sit, not feeding it new stuff, not feeding it new conversations, not developing thought trains, not reminiscing, cutting off reminiscences when they arise, and it will gradually settle. So start off by trying to settle the mind. If your mind is a little settled, see if you can get a sense of what I mean by opening the mind which is the beginnings of investigation, because it's revealing the mind to you. It's revealing to you the aspects of mind that you might otherwise not only overlook, but actually deliberately ignore, because you found them disturbing to your focus. And how about opening yourself up again? If you want to understand the mind, you better at least allow yourself to see it, to experience it. So let the phenomena of mind, let them through. Let them into awareness. Let them be there, uninterfered with, but not ignored. You could turn that round and say, be with it. If there's a memory there, be very clear there's a memory. You're not overlooking it, ignoring it, but you're also not developing it. It's just there. You're not pushing it away, but when it's time for it to go, it goes. So basically our task this morning is to practice in this way, to continue the process of arriving that I mentioned this morning. Notice the tendency to wander away and gradually train yourself to be more present. Notice what it is that tends to take you away and bring yourself back to be present with it. Not necessarily cutting it off, but being present with it. This is the beginning of opening the mind, which is the beginning of the process of investigation. And then this afternoon I'll introduce another method which helps us focus the investigation more directly. I'm not expecting that you'll all be fully arrived and fully present um, by then, not, not, not by any means. It's a process which goes on gradually over a few days and we're making a start on it now. Sometimes we say we can treat a retreat as an adventure as an experiment, as an exploration. We might not know where it's going, but we still want to do it. We have some confidence at least that it's worth giving a try. So have that attitude to it and try and be more wholehearted in your approach to it. And if you find yourself holding back, well, there's something to be investigated. Why am I holding back? Is there something I'm afraid of? Is there something I'm unsure about? 
If you find yourself holding back, get a sense of what's behind that. This is a sort of metaphor for the whole of retreat. Whatever arises, is there something behind it? Am I hiding away something behind? Someone said last evening he had a sense of there's more stuff to be found yet, there's something hiding. Indeed there is. We don't understand merely ourselves. But it's there to be discovered. And that's what we're going to be doing over the next few days. <laughs>